Big Ed here, and today I'm bringing you the Smith & Wesson Model 10. This revolver was originally made in 1899. Yes, it is 121 years old. And it is chambered in 38 Special. This particular revolver is a Smith & Wesson Model 10-3. It was made in 1961. So let's go ahead and give you a close-up of this revolver right here. So this is a double action revolver. And the controls on this are pretty simple. So first thing you're gonna do that's your cylinder release button. Push that forward and the cylinder rocks out. Therefore, you can verify that the revolver is empty. Second function is going to be your hammer right there. To go ahead, cock your hammer, you're going to get that real nice single action trigger pull. And then you're also going to have your double action trigger pull right there. And once you're empty out your cylinder and you're empty, you rock it out again. And that's your ejector rod. To eject your spent brass and that's basically it so it's a very simple function and the other thing I'll point out quickly is that this was made in 1899 revolvers are still made like this there's no difference to the new ones sure there's little differences here or there um, you know some of the materials used I'm sure the steels nowadays are stronger than this because the new ones Smith & Wesson is still producing the model 10s they are rated for plus p38 specials and some of them have even been made for 357s but not many this revolver and all revolvers nowadays are still made like these original revolvers. There's really very little difference. So let's go ahead to some of the differences that I'm aware of. The first one will be your hammer spur right there. You've got a nice little spur on your hammer instead of the transfer bar that's lo located in the frame. Also, the other thing too, and I just got this terminology, the Hillary hole. There's no Hillary hole in this revolver. Um, I thought that was pretty funny. Not quite politically correct, but funny. Next thing is going to be the assembly of this, um, and this is what a lot of people like. If you can see this little pin right there, that is a pin barrel. That is very desirable. People love these pin barrel revolvers. And the barrel is also one piece, and it is kind of crowned right there, which is, you know, which will protect the rifling of this barrel. And since this is a, if I can remember correctly, a 10 3, this has the heavy barrel on it. And when I bought this, I basically looked at it, and you can see it's got some pretty good wear on it, you know, on the barrel right there. See if that comes up on the camera. And, but the thing is, it was a very tight lockup, and obviously I bought this used because I was not around in, in, in the 60s. But I'm guessing that this was a police trade-in, and this came, you know, from a police department, you know, and it was probably carried a lot and shot a little because this shoots quite well for me. The other thing I'll make note of, too, are the screw placements in this, and I'm definitely not an expert on all the history of the Smith & Wesson revolvers, but they call that the trigger guard screw, and this one has it. I know a lot of guys like the trigger guard screw, and then also... You've got two screws right here on this dust cover right there to get to the clockwork of the of the revolver. And if I go ahead and open up the crane, hopefully this will come up on camera. Yeah, you can see it says 10-3 in there. And that's, you can verify what this revolver is. We'll give you a quick look at the sight picture. So these are basically just very simple you know, molded in sights into the frame of this revolver in the barrel. Uh, you cannot adjust them and they are what you get. Also, this front blade was widened up to, to an eighth of an inch instead of a sixteenth of an inch on the original ones. And you can actually see quite a bit of wear on there and there's even a little spot where it's probably dropped sometime within its life. So let's go ahead and look at all the markings on this. So there on the barrel it says you got 38. Smith and Wesson. This side it says Smith and Wesson on it on the barrel. Also, there's no other writing on this side. You can see the Smith and Wesson emblem right there, and I believe there is the. Let's see, made in the USA, Marcus Re Registratus Smith and Wesson Springfield, Mass. So that is definitely good stuff. So this is a nice piece of American history. So let's go ahead and uh, take a few shots with it. And as you know, I have a few 38 special revolvers, or that you know, 357 sort of shoot 38s. Um, so I just have some of my hand loads here, and these are just a mild 38 special, 158 grained, um, you know, soft lead projectile, nothing heavy. And I, if I can remember correctly, these are just loaded up and you know, right in the middle of the spectrum. So you know, they should be pretty, pretty moderate. And uh, but they seem to be pretty accurate in this gun. It does seem to like them. 
So we'll go ahead and we'll load up the uh, Model 10. So basically I'm just going to rock out our cylinder. Try to give you a good view of this. And it's a revolver. So it's, you know, nice thing about these, <clears throat> it's quite easy to load and quite easy to unload. The other thing about these revol any sort of a revolver, you don't have to worry about the ammo you're shooting out of it. Um, it's going to basically, you know, fire anything. And if it doesn't fire it, it probably means the ammo's junk and there's really going to be nothing wrong with you know with the revolver itself you could put bird shot in this you know, all sorts you can put the little real light probably 90 grains in there all the way up to you know 158 grain maybe even heavier than that and this gun's gonna you know run them just fine but it definitely seems to like the um, 158 grain lead projectiles so let's go ahead and we'll fire some of these off I also got <clears throat> got a nice leather holster right there I got it on eBay it's got some nice uh, engraving on it and I think I paid like 30 35 bucks for this but yeah it fits the revolver quite nicely and the muzzles just shy of the end of that so fits in here nice the other thing I wanted to make note of on this revolver is that there's no safety on it since it's a double action revolver there is no safety so that's something else you sh we should make note of too so I'll go ahead and I'll just shoot it double action here And you can see it's quite easy to shoot, quite easy to unload. So right now, I'm pretty close to these targets. I'm going to say, um, and we're going to we're going to shoot them in double action. Oh, I missed. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to do some double action shooting again, and we're trying not going to get any misses because we're not that far away from these things. But shooting a double action revolver is a, a little tougher than a single action gun or a striker fired firearm. Ah, one miss. All right, same drill again. We're going to do some double action work today. All right, so as you can see, I've moved the camera much farther away and myself from the targets. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to shoot them single action, which means I'm going to cock the hammer every time and then fire it, which means the trigger pull is going to be much better than the double action pull. And I should be able to hit these much better at distance. If I take my time a little bit and I go ahead and I cock the hammer every time, shoot it single action, it's definitely much more accurate of a revolver, but it also takes more time to shoot it. So let's go ahead and I'll give you a brief demonstration. And we are empty right there. So double action. And take a look at the trigger as I cock the hammer. See it come back? And then that probably reduces the trigger pull from anywhere I'm going to guess from 10 pounds down to three to four. Yeah, it's very light and there's no creep. There's no take up there. It's really smooth. Yeah, this revolver definitely has an excellent trigger. Um, Smith and Wessons are known, even a factory non-performance center one for all having very nice triggers. And the more you shoot them, it kind of polishes the internals the better these triggers get on the revolvers. Even this revolver has a better trigger than my 686, which is an L-frame. That's the other thing I'll mention too. This is a K-frame revolver. So the smallest Smith & Wesson is going to be a J-frame. Then you have the K-frame. 
Then you're gonna have the L frame, which is like the 686, all the 357s, and a they do make that combat magnum, the 44 five shot on an L frame. Then you're gonna have the N frame, which is all the 44 magnums, 41 magnums, the eight shot 357 magnums, and then you're gonna have the X frame, which is the 460 and the 500 magnums. So those are my targets right there, and I've even stepped farther back from my targets and we will go ahead and there is my new vehicle too um, I got rid of my Dodge pickup truck and that is my Grand Cherokee and we will go ahead and we will shoot these we'll get a little zoom in on this all right there we go so again I'm definitely I've got to be over 20 yards back from these plates um, Maybe even, ah, this is probably even farther, maybe even 25 yards. So I'll go ahead and we're going to shoot them single action and see what kind of these plates we can take out. So as you can see, that's pretty good. Uh, it just shows you the difference of being up close and being double action and the distance I can be from these things single action. I can hit pretty well. And how accurate this revolver is. This is, uh, it's definitely a lot of fun to shoot and uh, it's accurate. And I'm, I'm pretty impressed with myself on that, at, at hitting at that distance of those targets. We might even step back farther and see how, how good I can do. There we go, there's our target. So I'm guessing right now we're probably about, that's gotta be 60 yards away, at least. So we'll go ahead and we're gonna try to pop them. They're getting a little close to my car, but I'm not too worried about hitting it. I'm a pretty good shot, especially today. It looks like I'm shooting well. All right, so let's go ahead. Same thing, single action, and we'll try to nail these buggers. Pretty good, it's not bad. Um, I'm impressed with myself. I'll bring it all the way back just so you can see how far we are away from those. Not bad. So I think I've demonstrated um, pretty, pretty well, uh, exceptionally well, I think, how accurate this revolver is. And if you know how to shoot, and it all comes down to that trigger pull, if you know how to master that trigger pull, um, this is a very finely crafted revolver and it definitely works very well. Key to mastering is that double action trigger pull. So now we're close again to my targets. I'm going to say we're about five, six yards away, maybe seven, eight from that one right there. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to shoot them up close. And I have a, just a piece of wood there, just a, a cut off that's maybe about an inch and a half thick, maybe an inch, something like that. We're going to go ahead and we're going to shoot that and see how much penetration we can get on that, you know, just to see what these 158, 38 specials will, will punch through. I didn't flinch that time. So you can see, first we'll show that's oak right there, so it's reasonably hard. We'll say that's about an inch thick, a little fatter on the other side, but whatever. So I hit it with the 38 Special right there, and you can see it looks like it just bulged out the back. Uh, but that bullet is stuck in there, so it did not penetrate an inch worth of oak, but that is oak, so it is strong. So now we're just going to put the rest of these rounds in the wood and see if we can punch through it and how much damage we can do to that. So 
So you can see as the day's progressing, my double action shooting's getting better. So we got a hit here in the middle, and then I got one, two, three, four. So we definitely strung them up here. So it's definitely getting better, but it looks like this oak was pretty good at capturing. Uh, I'm going to say these two might have squeaked out, and that one squeaked out. But the rest of these, I think it, they captured them. It just pushed, because it's shooting with the grain, it's just pushing some of the grain out. Um, but that's what I would guess. So yeah, it's a pretty good barrier, but... So folks, as you can see, um, throughout the day, my shooting definitely improved. And, you know, I've been shooting a lot of different guns lately because of the COVID um, we're in. And we're in the second wave right now. And it's, uh, I believe today's November 14th, that it's resurging. So I've been shooting once a week, which is good for me, um, especially being in New York. And all pretty much all pistol shooting. I've done a little shotgun work. Um, I've shot two rifles. But it basically every weekend, and this weekend it looks like I'm going to go shooting twice because I have a three-day weekend here um, from work, and which I'm quite excited about. And my girlfriend's been shooting a lot with me too, which is definitely cool, and she's really starting to enjoy it. But it's a great COVID activity for us. But back to the Model 10. This came in a few different variations. It came in a 2.5-inch barrel, a 3-inch barrel, a 4-inch barrel, which this one is a five inch barrel and a six inch barrel. And a lot of guys considered, I believe Jeff Cooper was one of them and you know, post something if I'm wrong, that said that the four inch revolver was probably the most useful length of revolver, that your barrel's not so short where you're giving up a ton of velocity and it's easy to carry, but with the four inch barrel, it's still pretty easy to carry and you're still retaining some good velocity with that barrel length. So I picked this up up in Bates and Barrels in Riverhead for $350 and I bought this back, I'm gonna say, probably right around the first week in October. And I saw it sitting in the shelf, and there's two two versions. There was one with adjustable sights on it, and with a thinner barrel profile. And I looked at this one, and that that one was 450. This one was 350. And there's a bunch of guys in that store. Gun stores are very busy these days, you know, with the election when the election was coming up, and with the whole COVID, with especially with self defense, nobody's looking at these. Everybody's talking about semi-automatic nine millimeter pistols. I get it. I've got a few, and AR-15s and home defense shotguns, anything semi-automatic or, or pump action that was a 12 gauge or a 20 that was affordable. But nobody was buying these, so I paid what I thought was a very fair price for this, maybe even a little less. So I actually see them in this condition going for a little bit more online, closer to 400, 425. So I was very happy when I found this and I picked it up, and I, you know, and especially when I first shot it, I'm like, this is a really good shooter. So last thing, I got my score report for the Model 10. So the trigger we're going to give an 8. As you can see, it has an excellent single action trigger. The double action trigger is good. You can see as the day progressed, I did less missing. Was shooting some of those targets pretty rapidly. I was even impressed, you know, happy with my own shooting with the double action. And again, I'm shooting a lot of, uh, a lot of guns these days. Um, so we give it an 8 for the trigger protection because it's a 38 Special. We're going to go ahead and, you know, self-protection, we're going to go ahead and give it a 6. Um, because it's a 38 Special, actually, or give it a 6.5, whatever. Um, 38 Special is a proven round. Um, the reason police forces got away from it was because of barrier penetration. It doesn't penetrate that great, and they moved up to a 357, you know, back in, I believe, I'm going to say the early 30s, they they started to move away from 38 specials but this was carried by law enforcement for years but modern 38 day special loads you get hornady critical defense you know 110 grain 100 and you know 30 grain 158 grain they're fine even the lead projectiles i don't think are that bad because you get a soft lead projectile they're going to expand quite nicely so next we're going to have investment. I, I think these are good investments. These aren't great investments, but they're good. You're not going to lose any money with these. Take care of them. Don't let them rust. Don't neglect them. Don't overpay for them. And something like this is, I think, is going to slowly appreciate a value. Other thing I'll add to that is this is the most common handgun ever made. Um, there are over 6 million of these that have been produced by Smith & Wesson. So these are all over the place. Cool factor. Uh, the cool factor, this thing's going to get hit. So investment, I give it a six. Cool factor, I'm going to give it a three. Um, 
a lot of people aren't going to think these are that cool. It's a 38, you know, 38 gets poo pooed a lot. It's not interesting. Good thing about 38 special ammunition, it's all over the world. It's very easy to come by. It's inexpensive. It's not as cheap as nine millimeter. Actually, nowadays it is. It's cheaper. We have regular ammo prices. 38 is very easy to come by and it's very affordable. So versatility, same thing. It's, it's going to get a three. Um, it's not very versatile. Um, it shoots 38 special and you know you can run a different slew of bullet weights through it uh, But that's about it and you can shoot a uh, bird shot through here and turn it into a snake gun or a guarding gun a trail gun of some sort um, But it's not that versatile, but it does what it does and it does it well Go to war gun. I'm gonna give it a five. Um, it holds six rounds of ammunition. It shoots a 38 special It's um, being carried by military and police through World War one World War II, um, plenty of other, I'm sure it was in Vietnam. Um, actually, I know these were in Vietnam. Uh, plenty of other skirmishes around the world these were in. Police forces, I'm sure this was a police trade-in. So there's nothing wrong bringing this gun to war. If this is what you have, this is a good choice. Probably not as good as, you know, a, a modern-day polymer pistol. It'll hold 15 to 17 rounds, but, you know, that's why I give it a five. But it's still not a bad choice. Bang for the bucks, high. I give it an eight, um, $350 for, for a gun this great. Um, it, it's just, it, for an investment quality firearm, it's, it's a no-brainer. Shootability, eight, very shootable. It's easy, you don't have to rack a heavy slide, you don't have to load heavy magazines with stiff springs in them. Um, you rock out the cylinder, you can cock the hammer, shoot it single action. It's a very shootable gun. Doesn't recoil, recoil very heavily. Also, you can get Hornady's light loads, 110 grains for it, and I'm sure this thing is even, it's even easier to shoot. Firepower capacity, I'm going to give it a five. Th same thing with Go to War. I've already explained that. You know, it's going to be a good self defense gun. There's better choices, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it'll get the job done. It holds enough to get the job done. Concealability, I'll give it a four uh, because it's a four inch barrel. Um, and it's, it's got weight behind it, too. This is a full size handgun. I don't know what it weighs, but it's probably 40 ounces, give, you know, give or take a couple ounces, but it's, it's not light. And so the overall score for this is a 56.5, so it rates probably a little bit lower. I see my Kimber 10 millimeter I have up on the top here, um, 61.5. I should have thrown reliability in here because this thing will definitely get a 10, but most guns that I buy are, are 10 on the reliability scale. I don't have any problems with them except for that Kimber 10 millimeter. But folks, thanks for watching. You have any questions, post them below. Um, feel free to give this video a thumbs up and uh, feel free to subscribe to my video. Thanks for watching, folks. The other thing this gun feels, and I didn't want to add this into review, and some of my reviews are getting very long and lengthy, but <clears throat> instead of going out and chasing the latest and greatest polymer gun or buying a Glock, I was actually just picking up another uh, firearm a couple days ago at Bait and Barrels in Riverhead, and there's a guy up there just got his New York State concealed carry permit, so I congratulated him, so that the, uh, the main and man uh, sales guy in bait, Baits and Barrels on getting his permit and so what did he want for his first gun he wanted a glock 43x and the salesman quickly talked him out of that he's like that's kind of a proprietary it's magazines only work with that gun it's it's a it's a single stack you don't really want that gun it's a gun for concealed carry um so and then i told him and i'm like first gun glock 19 no brainer and then the guy behind the counter is like i'm a retired law officer he's like i've got a bunch of glocks i love them what do I have more than anything else? 19. So he was looking at the Gen and Gen 4 and Gen 5. I don't know which direction he went, but we both recommended either one of those guns are a fine gun. And I do. I have yet to shoot a Generation 5. But thinking about that, is that people go by these things all the time and they don't look at them, especially these younger guys. And there's nothing wrong with this. And if you want a gun for self-defense, um, you can look at the FBI statistics, what range, you know, protect self-protection shootings are happening also what kind of rounds how many rounds are being discharged and something like this will serve you just as fine you know with uh, is, is a glock 19 or or something like that and there's nothing wrong with those guns and if you want one go for it and i think they're excellent firearms go ahead and, and don't overlook these pick one of these up you won't be disappointed you know get some good hollow point ammunition for it and this will serve that function also you don't have to overpay for something you're not going to spend 700 or 800 dollars for a gun that should really only cost you 575 or 600 dollars and you can get this for 350 and this is a wonderful revolver as you've just seen from my video. It's extremely shootable, it's easy to work, you don't have to buy accessories like magazines for it, holsters are readily available for it, 
it's easy to work you can show somebody you can leave it loaded it's safe you don't have to worry about springs with this thing um, it's tried and true this technology has been around since 1899 and they still make them the same way with the same functionality but don't overlook these and you'll be happy and the other nice thing about one of these you go bu go buy one spend the money on it you can probably use it shoot it have fun with it clean it don't neglect it and then once this whole you know all the election is finished and Biden takes office and you know whatever happens in the future eventually gun sales will go back to normal and what will happen is you can still sell this gun probably for what you paid for it, and then you can go and get your Glock or your latest polymer or latest and greatest and spend what's correct for it and don't have to run all over the country and look on all these internet sites trying to buy something that you can't find and also trying to find ammo that's ridiculous and 38 special is tough to come by but it's probably easier to come by the nine millimeter I bet but this is a, good, a really good choice nowadays because nobody's looking at these things so I highly recommend in this political climate that we're in to pick up an older revolver you can get a good deal on these things and these things are and learn it learn how to shoot it that's important too you got to learn how to shoot learn how to shoot any gun how to be safe with it but these are excellent investments and also you know They'll, they'll, they'll take care of the tasks that you, that you put them up to as long as you do your part. But folks, thanks for watching again.